So this evening, Wendy and I will be presenting on planning for college and knowing your college options. College Access Plan is a nonprofit organization and we work collaboratively with PUSD, Pasadena Unified School District, um, as well as what you're here for, which is our parent university with parent family engagement department. Um, and we also wanna again, thank our collaborators, Collaborate Pasadena for allowing us to utilize their Zoom link. Tonight, we'll be covering um, and in, in the chat, Wendy, if you could post again, please, just making sure that all of our guests sign in for us. Um, so we will make sure that's in the chat. So please sign in. Um, and then from there, um, we are also going to be posting in a few minutes, a survey just to kind of see, test your knowledge, see what you know. From there, we're gonna talk a little bit about careers, jobs and lifestyle, the importance of kind of understanding how college and career work together the four steps to prepare for college, meeting the, uh, the admissions requirements for our colleges, building a strong college scholar profile, knowing your college options, paying for college, which I know we all wanna know about, which is very important. And then at the end, we'll end with a post survey and talk about next steps. So at that time, at this time, what I'd like to do is just give everyone a minute to do our pre-survey. So I'm going to stop sharing for two seconds. Let's see, did I do that right? Okay, and Wendy, if you wouldn't mind posting in the chat, I greatly appreciate uh, the link for the pre-assessment. We have it available for English as well as for Spanish. So just want to make sure that... Um, Everyone gets that. Thank you so much. So it looks like the, the Spanish has been posted and uh, we will also post the English link. So if you guys can just take a minute to do that for us. And while you're doing that, um, what I'd like to do is, I, it seems I'd like to just kind of, cause this is gonna be a little bit of interaction. I like to kind of hear who we have in the room. So I see that we have uh, a parent here from Sierra Madre I believe Sierra Madre Middle School, great. Um, if you could also put in the chat maybe where you're from or unmute yourself. Um, again, I'm Natasha Mahone, just so you guys know, I'm a parent in the district. Um, I have been a parent in the district for the last 15 plus years. My students have gone to Willard, uh, International Baccalaureate, uh, and then from there McKinley, and now my son is at John Muir High School, and I have a daughter at USC. So I've gone through this journey for those of you guys that are on that have kids that are in middle school or possibly in high school. I've gone through your journey and I've been where you are. Um, so, oh, I see. Thank you so much. We have a parent here from Blair as well. Perfect. Um, so just take a minute. The survey is only about 10 questions. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just kind of filling that out, just kind of we know where, where folks are at. Wendy, would you like to kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you while they're doing the survey? Thank you. You're muted. <laughs> it doesn't show I'm muted. Go for it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Uh, Wendy Duran, I fell in love with this profession uh, over 20 years ago. Um, I actually first discovered it as an undergrad student. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college. So everything that I know now, I did not know as I was going through middle school and high school. I knew that I wanted to go to college, but I didn't really have the skill set or the know-how. And I realized as an undergrad in my first um, internship position that students actually start preparing for college in middle school. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. Um, and so I kind of fell in love with that part and I've been doing it ever since. Um, you learn something new every year. So if you're a first time parent going through this journey, welcome. If you're a second or third time, it's never always the same. So, um, you know, feel free to ask questions and we're here as a resource. Excellent. All right, so um, we're getting ready to go on and we're gonna continue the presentation. I'll go back and share my screen. Uh, let's see, let's see. Well, that's, um, 
And again, I just want to make sure if we have those on the call that are, uh, would like to hear this in Spanish, please click the globe. All right, so let's go. I don't think anyone new has joined. Okay, thank you, Wendy. All right, so let's get into this. Let's hit play. All right. Okay, so what is the difference between a career and a job? Feel free to unmute yourself or throw it in the chat. But in, you know, if you think about a job, you think about a career, what are the differences between the two of those? And you can help me out, Wendy, if you see anyone, throw something in the chat or unmute. We would love to hear your voice. I know when I was younger, my dad would say a job is just over broke. <laughs> right? Uh, any takers, Wendy? Not yet. All right, we have quiet, quiet audience tonight. John here, willing to take it on. All right, thank you, John. No problem. So um, I always think of a job as being something that is just a single step along the ladder of your career. The, your career can be an entire arc uh, from the time you are maybe in high school through retirement, whereas a job is just one portion of that journey. I love that. I love that answer. Thank you so much. And you're, you're, you're right. A job is like one step. It's, uh, you don't necessarily have to have um, a degree. Um, typically a job, there may not be as much upward mobility, but a career is something that's, that is, you, it's longer, it's longevity. Most people with careers have some type of degree whether, or training. Um, so like a lawyer or a doctor, that's like a, a career, right? Being involved in a profession that may call for a professional degree or some type of professional training, whether you decide to be in the police force or something like that. So it's a little bit deeper, longer, um, and the, 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 the longevity of you being able to, to do it um, will last longer versus a job is something that could be short term. Um, you don't necessarily need a degree. Um, and as I mentioned, it the upper mobility as far as earning potential is typically lower in a job than it is in a career, which is again, the acronym just over broke. <laughs> and right. Natasha, I'm yes. somebody said job is temporary, career is a lifetime project. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So when we are talking to many of our students and our parents in PUSD and we talk about lifestyle choices, we want to make sure that our students and our families understand that your lifestyle choices, what you do now can benefit you in years to come. And oftentimes when you're looking at a career, you're looking at being able to have upward mobility. So possibly getting a certificate, whether that's a certificate as um, to PCC offers certificates, for example, you could get a certificate as a um, someone that does like medical coding, um, a certificate in being um, um, a, a esthetician or a beautician or in cosmetology. Um, and then up from there, you have an associate degree. The associate degree um, is something that you receive at a two-year college, a community college. Then you have your bachelor's degree, and that is something that you would receive at a four-year institution, a four-year college or university, and then your master's and or doctorate PhD, and that's called your graduate degrees. And so when we talk to students, we're talking to them about understanding your life choices and being able to do something that you're passionate about, but you plan for these things. So when you graduate from high school, the idea is, are you going straight into a career or a profession, or are you going to possibly go into college, a two-year or four-year college? And really being able to make that life choice and understanding upward mobility between possibly having a job and or actually going into something that's going to be a career that you're passionate about that's long-term. So within PUSD, our high schools offer career academies and pathways. Um, and so there are eight college and career academies. 
in six different industries. In each of our high schools, John Muir, Pasadena High School, Blair, and Marshall all offer one or more of these academies. So you have the Art, Entertainment, and Media Academy, you have the Public Service Academy, you have the Business Academy, Engineering and Design, Information Technology, and Health Science Medical te Technology. So when our students are in high school, they are encouraged to be involved in one of these academies because it also allows them or helps them to be able to identify what may be certificate they want to get or what college they possibly want to go to based upon a major or career choice. And so PUSD is lucky in that we have these career academies available to each and every one of our students. So if you're in the field and looking at one of our high schools, please know that we encourage our students to try to go to a high school that offers an academy that's in their passion. Um, a lot of times I'll have a student that says, Miss Natasha, I want to be a lawyer. Great. There's a law in public service academy that is being offered at PHS. I suggest you look into that if you want to be a lawyer, because high school allows you to really take the time to really dig deep to see if you really, really enjoy or like this career that you're possibly possibly wanting to go to college for. And high school is a place that you can begin to start exploring those things. Oh, Mr. Tasha, I want to be an engineer. I absolutely love like buildings and things like that. Oh, great. Okay. John Muir offers the engineering academy. And so possibly going there. So those are just some examples. And I want our families tonight to know that each of our schools offers career academies and it allows your student to be, to be able to explore and also get internships in high school um, so that they're able to kind of do the on the job kind of training or experience to see if they're really gonna like it. It's so funny, I was talking to a student the other day and she was like, I wanna be a nurse. And then she kind of started working in some things and she realized, uh, I don't like blood, <laughs> right? So, well, maybe we're gonna look at something different, right? In the medical field, because nursing may not be something you wanna do. So what we like to do now is kind of get into meeting the requirements when you're looking at going to college. And you start preparing for college in high school, right? It doesn't start in 11th or 12th grade. It really starts as you're entering high school in 9th and 10th grade. And so one of the things that we talk about that's very important is understanding you want to make sure that you're meeting the requirements for a four-year institution. And graduating from Pasadena Unified School District doesn't necessarily meet or mean that your student is eligible for a four-year institution. Yes, they're eligible to go to a community college, a two-year college, and we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. But the requirements for a four-year institution are sometimes a little different than general high school requirements. I'll just give you one quick example. Graduating from high school, PUSD, they require you take PE, for example, right? You have to take PE or be involved in some type of um, varsity sport for at least two years. Well, they don't require that you have to have two years of a foreign language, but our four-year institutions, our UCs and our Cal States require a minimum of two years in a language other than English. And so although you graduate from PUSD, but if you don't have at least two years of a language other than English, then your student does not meet the four year eligibility admissions requirement that colleges are asking for in California. So that's just an example. And I think it's very important that our parents know that as you're planning, make sure that you're meeting with your counselor at the school to make sure that your students are meeting these requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's get into this a little bit deeper. Meeting the requirement, schools are looking for students that have met the A through G requirements. We'll break that down in a little bit. Making sure they've met the GPA requirements, grade point average. Are your students involved in extracurricular activities? Um, do, did they decide to do something involved with rigor, whether it's taking PCC classes, dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment? 
Are they involved in IB courses at Blair? Or are they taking AP classes at our other high schools, whether it's Muir, Marshall, or PHS? Are they taking honors classes? So schools are looking, colleges are looking to make sure that our students are taking rigor, that they, are, they come in with strong GPAs, that they have met the A through G requirements, as well as they have extracurricular activities. Oftentimes parents will ask me, well, isn't grade point average most important? Actually, not necessarily. Many of our students, many of our schools, I'm sorry, many of our schools are looking for well-rounded students, making sure that our students are involved in extracurricular activities, involved in things at school, such as leadership, things within our community, such as community involvement and giving back, right? And so when we're talking about meeting admissions requirements, these overall well-rounded students is what our colleges are looking for. Great. So as Natasha was saying, they're looking for a whole package deal, right? They're looking for students who are um, engaged in their classes, but also doing something outside. Because guess what? When they get to the college campus, they want to make sure that students are going to do more than just go to class, do their work, and then not just go into the dorm room and play video games, right? They want to make sure that they have a vibrant campus community. And having that whole package deal is where that comes in. So we're going to move on to the A through G requirements, which is one of the really big components. Um, it aligns closely with the graduation requirements, but like Natasha said, there are some slight differences. So you'll hear the A through G's reference quite often. Um, something that's important to note is that these are the classes that students will need to take during high school and are required by the UCs, also known as the University of California and the Cal States. 23 Cal States. Just remember that number. I'm not going to tell you why. It was Michael Jordan's number, number one. Anyhow, um, so again, when another big difference with the high school graduation versus UC eligibility for four years is students must pass these classes with a C or higher, right? So we tell students a D is for do over. So Ds and fails are not considered a passing grade. And um, for those students who are who have not yet reclassified um, by the time they get to high school, only one year of advanced ESL or ELD can be used to fulfill one of those four years of English. And so each subject has a certain number of years that are the minimum requirement versus college competitiveness. So for history, students typically don't have a problem uh, fulfilling the two years that are required. They take four years of English for math, three years are required, but four highly, highly recommended. Um, math is one of those subjects that students either love or hate on the spectrum, um, but whether it is that they struggle with it, colleges really want to see that students fulfill those four years because it's one of those subjects that if you don't use it, you lose it. And regardless of major, they will have to take some level of math. So it's always just better that they don't take that break and that they push through it. For lab science, two years, um, of course, is the minimum requirement, but three years recommended. Some slight differences between CSUs and UCs. Sometimes they want a year of physical science versus a year of life science. But if you do like chemistry, biology, anatomy and physiology and physics, any combination um, for the two years. However, again, if they are looking to go into the medical field, they definitely want to go above and beyond doing that third or fourth year there. For the E, it's our language other than English. So depending on the high school, they offer different languages, whether it's Armenian or Spanish. Um, two years of the same language is the key right there. However, if they wanna take that third year, they're gonna be a little more competitive. So we highly recommend if they have room in their schedule to do so. Um, next is our visual and performing arts. It's, as long as it's a year long course, it's one year that's required. Again, if your student's looking into the theater arts, Visual and performing arts as a major, obviously they would wanna take more than just the minimum one year, right? Colleges wanna see that you've taken advantage of the opportunities available at your school. And finally, one year of a college prep elective. So anything above the minimum, so if a student takes a fourth year of math or a third year of a lab science, that automatically counts as one year of a college prep elective. If you have any questions as far as like what category, a, a, particular class at your school 
falls under, there is the A through G certified course list that you can access online. You go specifically to your school and you can see the different categories um, for history, what all qualifies for that. But um, where students usually have a little more interest is the visual and performing arts and the college um, electives. That's where schools really vary quite a bit. So we're gonna, we've shared a lot and we've talked a lot. So we wanna hear, do we have any questions? Um, in the chat. So let me, do we have any questions of anything that we've covered so far? And feel free to unmute yourself because this is an organic conversation. We definitely wanna make sure that we're answering all of your questions and meeting the needs of those that are here. Um, and uh, also, um, Gabby, if, if something is happening on the other chat, please let us know if, if there's something in Spanish, but please unmute yourself. Any questions about the A through G's, any questions about rigor, well-rounded student? Okay, Gabby said we're good. All right, call it going once, <laughs> twice. <laughs> All right, we'll keep going. Thank you. Okay, so meeting the requirements, it, you know, we talked about and what Wendy shared around our A through G's and going above and beyond, right? So when you're looking about going above and beyond, CAP, like, CAP likes to talk about our students' superpowers. Superpowers are something that a student is saying, you know what, I really, really love science, right? I'm not really a history person, but science is my jam. I really enjoy science. And so what we tell students is really try to take more classes in your superpower, take rigor within your superpower. So we suggest if science is something you enjoy, take AP science, right? Take a science class at PCC to show that this is something that you enjoy, that you're good at. But if you're not very good at history, why would you take AP world history, right? You can take an honors history or you could take regular history and still get a good grade. But if a, if history is not your jam, if history is not something that you really enjoy, that is not something we should be encouraging our students to take. Um, we should really encourage them to take classes in their superpowers where in things that they enjoy. Another example, my son, he's a math science guy, right? So math and science all day. He's taking like PCC math next year, pre-cal. He loves it, but he'll tell me, mommy, I don't understand history. He doesn't even understand the purpose of history. <laughs> and so we have encouraged him, please make sure you're taking rigor in your math and science. The other thing is take additional years. Two years of science is what is required, but three years is recommended or even four. So when you're trying to speak to a college and show them who you are, and they've never met you, they don't interview you, they're able to look at your transcript and say, wow, this kid applied to our science department. And it shows like he's taken science four years, or he's taking mathematics, you know, all the way to, to, you know, the highest mathematics you can take, we see that he truly is a science major versus they don't even see it on your transcript. Right. So that's important. Also making sure that you are taking um, additional in, um, language other than than span other than English, excuse me. So taking one more additional language other than English also shows that you're able to handle college work. And that's what colleges are looking for. So as you're looking to meet the requirements for college, look at your student's superpower, see what they enjoy doing. They Do they enjoy music, right? If they enjoy music, does it show on their transcripts? Does it show um, in their letters of recommendation? Does it show in their um, essays where they're talking about how they enjoy music and what they've done with music? Does it show that they've been involved in extracurricular activities outside of school with music? Oftentimes parents wanna show the sports, right? And they think, oh, that's extracurricular. But there's so many other things that colleges are looking for outside of an athlete. They're looking for those that love the arts, those that are interested in, in you know, giving back to their community and things like that. The last thing I wanna just mention 
is when you take rigor, you add to your GPA. So typically AP and honors classes allow you to get an additional point on your GPA. So look at that as well. So when you hear students say, oh, I have a 4.6 GPA. I know when I was in school, it's like, wait a minute, what? I thought the highest you can get was a 4.0, that's all A's. But actually when you take honors and AP classes, you can, as well as IB, you can actually get an extra point on your GPA that helps boost your GPA for colleges. Now, Ds and Fs don't count, but A, B, and Cs do. All right. Wendy, did I miss anything on that? Got everything covered? All good? Thank you. All right. So I mentioned this a little bit when, when we talk about GPA, grade point average. Grade point average, colleges are utilizing this to determine, and this is one way that they look at, one criteria for admissions, as well as financial aid, scholarships, and more. So the higher the GPA, typically the more money, the more scholarships, the more financial aid is available for students. GPA is calculated, um, unweighted is calculated as, as you can see on the slide, an A is worth four points, but if they take rigor, such as an AP, honors, or IB, that weighted GPA is worth five points. So if they get a five in an AP world history class or an AP physics class, that is actually worth five points. A B in your regular class unweighted is worth three points, but a B in your AP, honors, or IB is worth four points. A C is worth two and or three if they're taking rigor, AP, honors, or IB. And then a D is worth one point and an F is worth nothing. So oftentimes when we're talking to students, and this may sound like, ah, it doesn't really matter, but an F sucks the life out of your A. So we try to encourage students, Fs, like you don't have to get an F. Let's say you're in an art class that you really just maybe didn't care for. Do your very, very best. The F sucks the life out of your hard work and pulls your GPA down. You can never get a 4.0 on your GPA if you have an F, a zero, because the average will never be a 4.0 again unless you take honors or AP. So we really encourage students to make sure that they are getting A's, B's, and C's because colleges are looking, as well as looking, did you improve? So for example, if you took a math class and let's say you got a, a C or a B, but the next semester you improved, they're looking for that improvement. Your GPA, again, is like a credit score. The better your GPA, the better your credit, the more credit you have, the more money you can apply for, and the more college options are available for our students. You're muted. There you go. Okay. So as part of, you know, taking the right classes, adding that rigor, earning good and strong grades for that strong GPA, um, putting all that into a package deal is what we call the scholar profile. Similar to a resume, the scholar profile is going to compile all the amazing activities, honors and awards that your student has participated in and been recognized for. And this scholar profile basically they can start as early as middle school, but definitely start compiling that information. It's a living document, much like a resume from ninth through 12th grade, right? If they start doing this on a semester basis, because they will get, maybe they get honor, um, they're on the honor roll, the principal's honor roll, or get different awards in the fall semester versus the spring semester, get a binder. I know things have, a lot of things have gone digital, but you know, have a binder with the awards because it, it helps so much when you're looking to do your scholar profile. And it's something, again, they can start doing as early as their, after their first semester of freshman year, because they've already started, you know, doing stuff towards that. So the more that they update it, at least on a semester basis, the less work they're going to have to do once they are seniors and, uh, and having a lot more stress with all the other stuff that comes with being a 12th grader. And they'll have all their amazing, you know, activities and things to show for already. 
So a scholar profile is also important because the more details you have in there, the stronger your letters of recommendation can be. I know when a student has asked me for a letter of recommendation and they hand me a scholar profile, my letter is much stronger for them for that reason, because guess what? I get to find out things about the student that I didn't even know, right? Even when I think I know a student, that scholar profile really highlights so many other details that then as a recommender, be that a teacher, a counselor, an administrator, a priest, a father, wh wherever it is that you're getting that letter of recommendation from, from a, a Boys and Girls Club director or, or counselor, when you give that scholar profile, you're giving a full picture of who you are. Right. And so this is a form that you want to invest time into because then you can also use it for scholarship applications. So in essence, you are investing that time or your student is and it's going to pay for itself over and over and over again. So it's a great way for students to develop um, their skills, get organized and showcase all that they are. So again, colleges want that well-rounded student, right? They want more than just a great student that's going to complete um, their coursework and graduate. They want someone that outside of that is going to join clubs, organizations, be it sports or intramural sports. Um, so that scholar profile is gonna help package that student together. So what, what all is entailed in that scholar profile, right? Any awards and honors, and it can be as little as from the classroom, from the class of, from the school, from the district, from the city of Pasadena, the county of Los Angeles, the state of California, it could be nationwide. So you can see how it really can fully expand, right? So your student may start small in ninth grade, but as they start going in 10th grade and 11th grade, um, they really add on to a bunch of different things that they um, either have participated in or have been recognized for. Um, PUSD has a plethora of educational prep programs, so students are so lucky to be able to be have access to so many of them. Uh, tutoring, CAP is just one of them, and something that makes CAP a little bit unique than other some of the other college prep programs is that there is no application, right? So it's literally open. If you are a PUSD student, it doesn't matter if you're a first gen or a fifth gen generation, low income or high income or anything in between, we don't look at any of that. So if you are a student who wants help and wants just getting some assistance and getting organized, we're here to help you after school. Every high school in PUSD gets um, two days after school for the for traditional school. So they're there either Monday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday, and we'll give you the schedule for that in a little bit. They also wanna see about their extracurricular activities. So if they have any leadership roles, did they start a club? Maybe there was a club that they were interested in, but it didn't exist at their high school, right? Um, I've seen students sometimes actually go into like a local college and say, oh, they have, they actually have a club of this. And they sometimes get mentored by college students to start their own high school club version um, on their campus, right? So they get a teacher who becomes an advisor and then they get, I think like, what is it? Seven or 10, 12 signatures to get that started and boom, they have a club, right? And now they get to put on their scholar profile, I am a founding member of X club. So things like that are really gonna highlight your student and it's showing that they're passionate about something, right? So whether it's sports, art, robotics, let it be what it is. Let your students shine um, and do volunteer work and community service. I know that's been a little bit funky the last two years with the pandemic, but there have been virtual opportunities. You just have to get a little bit creative. Um, here at, next, it says other coursework. So some of the things that students would put in that scholar profile in that section would be anything that has to do um, related to maybe academies, right? Or electives that connect with their passion. And for work experience, it could be tutoring students at their elementary, right? Or tutoring younger siblings, um, or you know, having an actual job where they get paid. Maybe they, they started off as volunteers at the Boys and Girls Club, but then they get a little side job a few hours a week. That counts as well. So um, there are different websites that students um, can 
join. Uh, again, Pasadena has so many awesome opportunities. This is one where you can find virtual opportunities, but if students wanna do in-person, like day one is a great place for students to be able to get involved in different types of things. And they offer things year round and during the summer. So if your student has a really impacted um, schedule during the school year and they wanna you know, do some more hours during the summer, they're always welcoming volunteers during the summer too. We're gonna take a pause here and hear some voices from our audience. Anybody have any questions? And when did you wanna check the chat as well to make sure we don't have any questions yeah. in the chat? Thank How you. do we guide a student who has equal passions in foreign language, science, sports, and music? Be well-rounded, take all, or focus on one to two passions. Wow, that's a good one. Um, you know, what I would say is, it, it, if the student is entering high school, um, I would let them explore if they, you know, I know that some schools, for example, like Mir, you can take up to, you have eight periods because they have like a college schedule. So they have space within their um, coursework at school in their school day to be able to kind of take quite a few electives and, you know, maybe cross academies, take something in business as well as art, right? Um, the other way, um, and, and, I, and I get it, so with foreign language, sometimes doing things in the summer, taking summer classes at PCC, um, possibly to kind of break it up versus doing it during the school year. Um, and then of course, sports can be year round. Um, so I would suggest allow your student though, to be able to, um, rise and kind of say, you know what, this is what I enjoy doing. And you as a parent help them manage that. It, they may not be able to do everything in a school year or in the fall or in the spring. They may have to pick and choose what's most important to them um, and then do some things during winter break or spring break and not be able to do things all at once. Um, Wendy, I don't know, did you have something else to add for that? Um, I, I think if if they can start, like Natasha said, in ninth grade, just kind of being open and seeing, you know, attend different clubs and organizations and see what is going to fit better with what they're passionate about, what they liked more. Um, sometimes the vibe of a club or organization has to do with the leadership, right? Who's there? Um, so maybe in ninth grade, they decide like, hey, I really like this club and um, organization and then stick through it, right? Um, but ninth grade can be a year to explore. By 10th, you really want to have more of a honed down list of what you really wanna delve into. Um, also maybe possibly exploring careers and seeing how some of those different passions, like is foreign language gonna be really important if they wanna do you know, global business or they wanna go into the medical field where we're always uh, you know, in shortage of people who speak more than one language. So looking at that, that might benefit their student. Thank you. Yeah, that was really good. Thank you, Wendy. All right, so let's get into this. So knowing your options, knowing your college options, we're going to go through this and hopefully give you an understanding around um, our California systems of higher education. So um, in California, we have our Cal States. There are 116 Cal States in the state of California. So they have options for community college. Uh, we have 23. I'm so, did I say that right? Did I say Cal State? Oh yeah, my gosh. Let me correct that. I'm so sorry. Fix it. So we have 116 community colleges throughout the state of California. We have 23 Cal States, California State Universities. We have nine um, University of California UCs and or 10, which is a professional, um, our 10th one is a professional school, which is uh, University of San Francisco. We have 85 independent college and universities, private schools, such as like a USC or a Pepperdine, Occidental, things like that. And if I can just add to, um, you know, they kind of, the state of California back in the 60s, right? <laughs> Established that, hey, we have so many different colleges and universities. So we want to make sure how, how can a student prepare to, how will they know what should they be preparing towards, right? So they decided that the different um, institutions, the different like community colleges, the UCs and the Cal States were going to focus on different specialties. And so as part of that, they kind of became systems, right? 
the, the community colleges became a system, the Cal, the Cal States became a system. Um, and so that way students were like, well, if I wanna go to a Cal State that focuses on teaching students, they knew, okay, I'm going to, I'm potentially working towards being eligible towards 23, remember 23 Cal States, right? Um, same thing with the UCs who have more of a focus on research. Um, and then I'd say the other distinguishable um, difference between um, the first three, community colleges, Cal States and UCs is that they receive funding from the state, from the government, right? So they receive government funding. And as a part of that, they're, they're governed by that. Whereas the independents, also known as the privates, they do not receive state funding. And so they're much more flexible with their requirements. They're not as rigid like as a system per se. And there is a wide range of um, how, how competitive campuses are at the independent level. Thank you. So there are 116 California um, community colleges. Our California community colleges, uh, their degrees, they offer certificates and a vocation, as well as associate degree and the option to transfer to a Cal State UC and or private school. The requirements to go to a community college are high school diploma, uh, or graduating from high school, uh, GED, um, but they don't have requirements like a UC or a CSU. Um, so you don't necessarily have to meet certain um, grade uh, GPA, take certain classes. It's really open for students. Um, but again, if you have a high school diploma grade and or a GED and or 18 years or older, there are many students in PUSD that are currently doing dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment, meaning they're in high school right? Dual enrollment is I'm in high school, Mir offers dual enrollment, and I go to math for first period, and my third period class is over here, still on campus at Mir, but it's a PCC um, class, and I'm taking speech, for example. So that's called dual enroll, being enrolled at the same time, doing your high school um, school a lot of time. Concurrent enrollment is meaning it means that you are also enrolled in high school and you're enrolled in college. So you're enrolled at PCC thereafter. Um, and so what happens is you may go to school and then from there, when you after school, you go and you take a PCC class or maybe um, in the summertime, you're taking a PCC class. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's concurrent enrollment. The application deadline is on December 1st. And, um, and so qualifying for um, the California Promise Grant um, waives the two-year tuition fee. It's a small fee for community colleges. Community college fees are typically much lower as far as cost per unit than our Cal States and our UCs as well as our privates. Wendy, would you like to add anything about our UC or um, community colleges? No, you did a great job. I think other than it, it's always an option, right? Um, the community colleges will always be there. And I think sometimes a, maybe a slight misconception that students who may not be as academically inclined in high school have this thing about like, oh, I'll just do better when I get to, when I get to um, PCC or the community college, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And that learning loss, if they're not academically really working hard, they're ninth through 12th grade, everything that they didn't learn in high school, they're going to have to catch up somewhere. And then it ends up happening at the community college. So sometimes that's when the transfer um, time kind of gets elongated from the two years um, because they do need the 60 transferable semester units um, to be able to transfer as an upper division student at either the UC, the Cal State, or the independent colleges or universities. So we have 23 Cal States. How many? 23. Okay. <laughs> 23 Cal States all throughout the, um, you know, throughout the state of California. The furthest one up north is Humboldt and the lowest one down south is San Diego State. But I have the um, first two on the top left highlighted in orange for Cal State LA and Cal State Northridge because they do give priority to our students. We are within their local service area. So again, another reason why PUSD students are so lucky is that um, 
every district, not every district has a campus that they can say, well, we fall within their local area. No, we don't just have one, we have two. So Cal State LA and CSUN are always an option where students will be given priority if they're coming from PUSD, but some other great options, but maybe a little more competitive are Long Beach State, Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State Fullerton, and then San Bernardino and Dominguez Hills. So the next slide is going to show just sort of like how spread the Cal States are. As I mentioned, Humboldt, which is maybe like 14 hours away. Um, I think traffic has gotten worse, so maybe 16 hours, um, but it's a beautiful campus and each campus sort of has something amazing that they offer. I highly encourage, I know it's been kind of, again, funky with the pandemic, but if you get a chance, especially during um, the ones that are more local, a lot, a lot of our um, students have a lot of days off during the week that universities are still in session. So as things begin to open up again and campuses begin to resume their um, campus tours, I highly recommend for students to go. And even if they start local first so that they can see what kind of campuses they feel like they would be happy at. And campuses are like shoes, right? They're, you can have a lot of comfortable shoes, um, but just because they're comfortable on me doesn't mean they'll be comfortable on you. And so as they start to kind of visit different campuses, they get an idea of like, oh, I really like this vibe. It's very casual here, or people are really friendly here, or they can't, or, you know, I really like this like open, very like foresty feel. So just getting an idea of where your student's going to be happy is important. So as I mentioned, Cal States as a system, their minimum GPA is now a 2.5 GPA plus the A through G requirements, which we went over what those were. During the pandemic, they added something called the supplemental factors for admission. So there will be a, an extra set of questions that students will answer. Um, and based on that, they'll get extra consideration. Students will apply. Now, November 30th has always sort of been like the hard deadline, but obviously there have been some catastrophic situations that have happened. And sometimes um, the deadlines may get extended, but really, if you can just um, know that they have more than enough time to apply. Don't leave it until the last minute. And this is, again, another great way where CAP can help support your student, kind of help create a college list, start investigating where they want to apply. Every campus has a different level of competitiveness to see, do you want, you, you want to have your high reach schools, your safety net scores, and your reach schools, right? So um, looking at that, it's $70 per application and a student can apply to be considered for a fee waiver. If they do qualify, it's actually inside of the application. They answer a set of questions. Um, they get up to four campuses if they qualify. So we encourage that if they do qualify and maybe they only had three CSUs in mind that they take advantage of the full four campuses. Um, the housing is going to vary. So obviously real estate is um, very dependent on where you're located, right? So it's gonna be a lot more affordable to live in Bakersfield or San Bernardino than it is going to be in Fullerton or San Diego. And then, um, so just kind of research to see that as well, to see if that's gonna be, um, you know, what the living situation is gonna look like, what they offer and how competitive it is. Do they, uh, do they guarantee admission, um, sorry, housing for freshmen or, what are the options if they don't get to live on campus to see, you know, that's part of a big component of when you're looking at a college as well. And the type of degrees that Cal States offer, your bachelor's, master's, teaching credential, and then they have added a limited amount of PhDs that are in conjunction mostly with the UCs. Next we have our UCs, the University of California. Um, the GPA is slightly higher at a 3.0, but again, that is the minimum, right? So um, the minimum is not gonna be enough for Berkeley, UCLA, um, UC San Diego, right? So it's important that students are really thriving and going above and beyond, um, you know, 3.5 and higher if they really wanna be competitive to depending on the type of UC that they're looking to go to. So UC Riverside, UC Merced um, would be, and UC Santa Cruz would be some of the more uh, less selective campuses, but it really just always depends on the number of students that are applying for the year that your student is applying in. So one year the GPA may be higher 
that's just because the graduating class of that particular year is more competitive. Um, they also require the A through G requirements and the four PIQ, which is the personal insight questions. They used to be called personal statements. They're basically um, four questions that they answer um, sort of in a short version, not like your typical essay version. And again, it's something that CAP can help them with. Um, they can pull stuff from their scholar profile into that. Um, the UCs really focus on a holistic review. So they're not just looking at how many APs the student took or what the GPA is, right? They're looking at the whole picture of the student. Some campuses, um, for instance, like Berkeley, will sometimes if they're on a fence of a student, um, they might uh, submit a supplemental questionnaire where they'll ask students additional questions. Um, they, they're also the cost currently is 70 per application and similar to the CSUs if they do qualify um, based on how they answer the questions within the application, they will qualify for four campuses. Um, and then similar to the Cal States, BA, master's, teaching credential, and PhD along with professional degrees. Finally, we have our independent colleges. As you remember, they do not receive uh, funding from the government, therefore they are not governed by them. Um, so how many students they admit or what the criteria they establish is de completely dependent on each individual campus. So we do ask that students research the individual universities or institutions to see, okay, based on how I'm doing with my GPA, my coursework, how competitive I am, um, what kind of campuses would be a good fit with what possibly if they have an idea of what they wanna study. Um, because they're not part of a system, like the UCs for instance, um, where you just fill out one form and at the end you select what campuses you wanna apply to, um, they have established something with the common application where students will pretty much, um, complete certain basic information. And then each campus may have some additional questions that are specific um, to that campus. Um, something that's really unique to the uh, independents versus like the Cal States, for instance, who may can be considered a little more of a commuter campus. The independents tend to be very residential. In fact, some of them actually um, require for students to live on campus, either a certain number of minimum of years or all four years. They also tend to focus on a holistic review and the opportunities for scholarships are based on anywhere from a student's academic record, their athletic ability, leadership, merit. So they have a wide range of opportunities available. So one of the big differences you'll see um, between like the UCs, Cal States versus the independents is the cost of attendance. Um, so you, you might notice they might be in the 70,000 or 80,000. You, you might wonder why is it almost double? Um, and that's because they don't get that, that government funding. And then finally, Natasha. So our out-of-state schools, um, there are more than 5,000 public and private out-of-state colleges and universities. The application as well as the cost of attendance and their admissions deadlines vary. It depends um, from state to state and school to school. Um, when a student attends an out-of-state college or university, they typically have to pay out-of-state fees and, um, and uh, out-of-state tuition. And so the cost of attendance would be higher for a student going to, for example, somewhere in New York than it would be if a student was actually going to school here because they are paying out-of-state fees. Um, lastly, it, um, many of our, there are quite a few uh, universities that are part of the WUI exchange. And so if they're part of the WUI exchange, for example, states like Arizona, Oregon, Portland, Washington, they're able to, although they're out of state, there is an agreement between California and the states that I mentioned to allow them to be considered not residents, but be their tuition and their fees are considered as if they were a resident. So their fees and tuition are lower at some of those schools, as well as in particular subject uh, matters and, or majors. So for example, um, if a student in California wanted to go to, let's say, ASU in Arizona, ASU is one of our WUI schools, we're in part that um, is in partnership underneath the WUI exchange, but they were majoring in business. 
well, business is a highly sought after degree. So mm -hmm. they may not be considered for WUI as far as lower tuition, but something like engineering or um, mechanical uh, science, they would be able to then possibly apply underneath that school for that degree and be able to receive a discounted rate on their tuition and fees. So, you know, we've talked quite a bit, right, about colleges, what they're looking for, um, what their requirements are, right? But we also, as parents and as students, we also have um, choice in the matter. And so it's important that our students and families are looking for schools that are right fit for your student and for your family. Um, you know, a lot of times when we talk to students, it's like, oh, I want to go to USC. I want to go to UCLA. Okay, great. You know, those are those name brand schools that everyone talks about. And yes, you know, if you got into them, you know, it's like, you know, bragging rights, but are they the best fit for your student, right? And so it's important that when you're looking at schools, that you're looking at schools that your student is going to thrive at. If your student loves a smaller school, more intimate, knowing their professor, things like that, they may want to go to a smaller liberal college. They may want to go to um, maybe a smaller Cal State where there's smaller classroom sizes and their actual professor is teaching the class and not a TA. But if they love the big school and they don't mind being, you know, number 310 in a classroom and they enjoy that big feel, then great. They may want one of our UCs where they are, you know, not necessarily um, knowing the professor and having like office hours, but they're meeting with smaller groups and having smaller classes with TAs and things like that after the lecture has been given. So, you know, right fit, do they want cold weather, hot weather, right? Do they, do they mind being back east or would they prefer being somewhere like sunny California? The other thing you look at when you're looking at right fit is making sure that your student is realistic about um, the school that they apply to. For example, UCLA has, I believe it's a 12, 14% admission rate. Yeah. So if your student is a 3.5, you know, B plus GPA, that may be a reach for your student, right? Um, however, applying to Cal State Long Beach or Cal State LA or Cal State Northridge may be something that's more of a target for them versus a reach. So it's really important when they're looking at schools, how do they fit? If they're applying to a school and they're really interested in, and for example, um, doing something within um, the arts and performing arts, but they're applying to a school that doesn't really have a performing arts major degree in acting or something that they like, that may not be the right fit for that student, right? Or if they have a very competitive performing arts program where it's like, you know, you needed to have, you know, performed since you were like in grade school um, and they're applying to it and it's highly, highly competitive, that may not be the right fit. So it's really important when students are applying and as you're beginning this process and you're looking to the end with the end in mind, you're kind of backwards mapping this. You're saying, hey, my student, their passions are around this. And these are schools that are safety schools. Like they meet the requirement. They have their major. My student has shown on their scholar profile that they are, they're in the house. This is ideal. They're ideal for this college. This other school is a target. Like we, we are right there. We meet the GPA requirement, things of that nature. And then you have your reach schools. So when you're applying, you're making sure that you have a little bit of both because it allows your student to truly have choice when it's time to make a decision. The other thing is right fit, like in a being affordability. Can you afford this? Is this something that is within um, um, your budget? Uh, is it a state school? So your student's like, well, I want to go out of state. Okay, great. Well, those out of state fees may cost as much as a private school here in state. So looking at that and affordability, as well as making sure that, again, our students that we have worked with that are 
preparing to go to college, that they are showing that they are well-rounded. And if the school is looking for a student that has been involved in extracurriculars or leadership and has a strong GPA, that you're marrying, marrying, thank you, those all together so that truly this is a right fit in a school. It's like, that's the student. When they were, when they were in high school, they had me in mind, right? And so it really is, is a perfect marriage for the school and the student. I know that brings us to that um, question slide, and we did get a question in the chat. Can you comment on recent changes to SAT requirements and how it applies to public versus private universities? So in the state of California, um, and if you're familiar with the lawsuit that actually um, that um, was won, utilizing the SAT and ACT standardized tests for admissions requirements are no longer they're no longer able to do. So utilizing SAT, ACT as a requirement for admissions is no longer being done in California with our Cal States, with our UCs, as well as our privates. However, they can utilize SAT and ACT once a student has been admitted for placement. For, for example, if a student needs to be placed at a higher level math, and the student has taken the SAT, they may look at their, their math score to find out, oh, this student should be here. But it is not utilized for admission purposes. Um, Wendy, do you want to add to that at all? Um, that's basically it. And that's where the, um, the other items that we spoke about, right? Taking the rigor, um, being passionate, showing that you're taking advantage of those educational opportunities. I'd say that for the privates, um, you can always, we always encourage students because they're not part of a system and they're not all on the same page of something, um, research the individual campuses to see if they have a preference. Yeah, great question though, thank you. Any other questions about what we've discussed so far around scholar profile, around right fit, around admissions requirements for our Cal States, our UCs, and our, our uh, independent private schools. And again, feel free to unmute yourself and or put it in the chat. All right. Let's talk so, about paying for college. Let's go, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to qualify for one of the four financial aid, students must complete the FAFSA or the California Dream Act to qualify. Um, either be it for the grants, for scholarships, um, for the work study program or loans that are for students and parents. And so the FAFSA, um, the federal government really wants families to know that you should not be paying anyone to help you fill out the FAFSA form. That's why the word free is the very first um, letter in the acronym, free application for federal student aid is what FAFSA stands for. Um, and so it's a free application and students who would qualify are US citizens, permanent residents, eligible non-citizens or T visa holders. Um, California has, we're very fortunate to have the California Dream Act. So for students who are considered undocumented or hold DACA or temporary protected um, status, TPS or are a U visa holder or are eligible for the AB 540, that's sort of like the sister application called the California Dream Act. They have the same priority filing period. So it opens up October 1st. Um, the priority filing period typically ends on March 2nd. And again, um, we're gonna go on to the next slide that shows pots of money. We always encourage students to fill out their application sooner rather than later, because there is certain pots of money that are limited and they kind of get processed sort of on a first come first serve basis. Um, so on the left side, you have the financial aid, which is the FAST for the California Dream Act. And then down below, you'll see the CSS profile for privates or independent colleges. Um, some privates will ask students to complete that. It's an additional form that they would do. So um, if they're going, for instance, to USC, they would do the FAFSA and the CSS profile, or if they're under, um, they qualify for the California Dream Act, it would be the California Dream Act plus the CSS profile. Um, and then on the right side is the scholarships, right? And this is where that scholar profile, that whole 
that whole student, right, who's showing all of their passions, this is where it pays off to really delve into a passion and to really be active during your high school years. Because scholarships, there's a wide range of scholarships, and I always tell students, make scholarships your part-time job, right? Because you can always earn more money applying for scholarships than you can working at any part-time job that you can potentially get as a high school student. Um, and sometimes students are like, well, do I wanna write an e like a 500 word essay for $500? And it's like, even if you spend 10 hours on that particular application, that's $50 an hour if you get that scholarship, right? So, I mean, that's a pretty great, pay return for a 17, 18 year old student. And I always tell students, what else could you be doing that would pay you $50 an hour, right? And of course there's um, bigger scholarships that are $1,000, $5,000, $10,000. And there's really unique scholarships and weird scholarships for like being left-handed, having curly hair. If uh, you're a, a family member um, survived cancer, right? So there's the need base, the merit base, and then there's the everything else based. So feel free. This is something that um, I learned early on when I was in college. I was like, oh my gosh, I could have been doing this in high school, right? And so I always encourage even our middle schoolers, I have them look up scholarships to see, oh, I can get a scholarship for this. Yes, you can, right? If you're artistic, there's a greeting scholarship. They pay $10,000 if they pick your artwork for a greeting card. It could be a birthday card, a Christmas card, a holiday card, right? So for something that a student might consider being fun, they can get paid $10,000 to go towards their college education. Um, so scholarships, 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 so, so important. This is what helps make it a lot more affordable, less out-of-pocket costs for families. Um, and this is where the student then can really have control of, do I want to live on campus, right? Do I want to? And can I afford to? This is the key ticket right here is applying to scholarships, apply to many, many, many scholarships. You can't apply to too many, honestly, right? And there are some scholarships that you can look into that um, you may apply as a 10th or 11th grader that will hold the funds for when you go to college. Um, there are scholarships that you can apply to to participate in uh, college prep programs that are during the summer that cost money. Um, so again, this is where that scholar profile comes in really handy because then they can give it to that teacher for that great letter of recommendation. When you ask for letters of recommendation, you don't just ask for a letter of recommendation. You ask, can you write me an outstanding letter of recommendation, a strong letter of recommendation, right? Um, and they do that by demonstrating that scholar profile and also building relationships with teachers. Have your students build and cultivate that relationship. So a teacher, by the time your student is a junior and is applying to something, right, the teacher can say, oh yes, that student has blossomed and flourished from when I first met them as a ninth grader, right? So keeping in touch and cultivating and nurturing those relationships is important too. And so I think, yeah, any questions on any the, anything we discussed, financial aid, scholarships? paying for sure. college. Okay. I, I have a question. Um, sorry, I didn't, I couldn't text fast enough. Um, okay. um, is there a good resource uh, site for researching all different types of scholarships? There's a wide range of sites. And so if they, if your student comes to, are, is this, are you this, um, a parent who's at Blair? Yes. Okay. So um, if your student goes to CAP, um, either I think we'll give the schedule in a little bit. Um, when when she comes to CAP, um, she'll get hooked up with a Google Class Classroom, and it'll have links, different links that they can access to start researching different scholarship opportunities. Okay. So I mean, they and and well, do you want to go to the CAP drop in, Natasha? Not oh. yet, but okay. I, but we can. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, can you remind me, Miss Joanne? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, CCGI is just an online platform and the district pays for every middle schooler and high schooler to have an account. And one of the great things is that um, parents also can activate their own free accounts and link it to their students account. Um, and this website helps students with researching different types of colleges, looking into careers, right? What kind of careers, um, if they're interested in a particular career, what kind of majors are necessary? And then they can work their way backwards and okay, now that I know what career I want, what majors I need, what colleges 
offer those type of majors. And then ultimately from their senior year, they're actually gonna launch their CSU, their UCN, their, um, their FAFSA or California Dream Act, Dream Act application from this site called CCGI. So um, that's the short version, CCGI, but it's californiacolleges.edu. If your student hasn't activated the account, it's really easy to do. They just go into the sign in, click on register. They answer the questions, I am a student, from Pasadena Unified, the school they attend, they enter their student ID, their date of birth, their email address, and then it gets activated. And so um, for the student, um, Ms. Joanne, uh, for Blair, Natalie is there Mondays and Wednesdays. So students can, um, any student who's in ninth through 12th grade in PUSD, they, we have a schedule that we follow. So um, we're there after school from 345 to 545. Mondays and Wednesdays, we have um, Blair and Marshall and the room locations are there. So for Blair, it's li the library. Tuesdays and Thursdays are Muir and Pasadena High School. And if you just, sometimes we have to make certain changes just based on the pandemic, but you can go to our website at collegeaccessplan.org forward slash drop in, and it'll always have the most up to date information. For instance, let's say if something happened in the library and we couldn't use that, um, there would be like a little notice of where to go. And finally, our contact information for Natasha and myself is on the left, and for the high school team, um, Daniel is our newest team member, and he actually runs the junior um, 101 class that just started, uh, I think we're in our second week right now, at all of the high schools. And he also, in the fall, does the writing intensive program um, geared towards seniors and juniors. Natalie is at Blair and Muir, as well as Rose City during the day twice a week. And Cynthia is at CIS, Marshall, and PHS. So, Ms. Joanne, if, um, if your daughter or son just goes on one of those dates, they, it could be for 20 minutes. They don't have to stay the entire two hours. They can make it fun. They can come as little or as often as they like, but obviously the more time they invest in coming and getting started with the process, um, the easier it's going to be and the less sort of stressful it's going to also um, be with they, when they get guidance. Sometimes hearing the information from a family member versus like someone else, um, tends to sometimes click. So yeah, but Natalie would be happy to give her the Google link classroom. And it'll also have some resources with different types of um, websites they can access their financial aid for scholarships. Finally, you can follow us on social media, whether it's Facebook, IG, Twitter, or on our website. Um, please keep in touch. And um, while we open up the floor to questions, I know that Natasha has entered the post evaluation. So if you can um, answer the questions and participate, that would be wonderful. Um, we will report back to the district um, for those of you who are getting, uh, working towards a certificate so that you get that credit. So there are a couple links in the chat. Um, one of the first links that I sent is called parent, it's called homework. And basically we're encouraging every single parent to sign up for a CCGI account and linking it with your student's account. So if you do that, I'm telling you, you are going to be 10 times ahead of the game. CCGI is an amazing resource that PUSD pays for to support students and families to make sure that they're A through G eligible, as well as researching for college and careers, and financial aid. So please, please, please fill out. It's called Homework Parents, Please Register. Click on that link. Also in the chat is a link, an evaluation that our district has put out to please rate how you felt this workshop met your needs and or didn't. So we can make sure that we are meeting the needs of our community, our parents and our students. And then lastly, there was a pre survey in the very beginning. So I just posted the post survey. It's in English and in Spanish. I'd like to know what your knowledge is now after we finished the workshop. So hopefully you gain some knowledge and some information. Please feel free again to unmute yourself or put yourself notes in the chat, any questions you have in the chat. We would love to answer any questions, even if it's something that maybe we did not cover and you have questions about. Wendy, we were good. There's no questions. 
Look at that. Like, wow. No, okay. no, I have a question. <laughs> Good. Go ahead. Yes. Hello. This is Joanne. My daughter's at Blair. She's a ninth grader. Nice. Um, um, it sounds like uh, for more of the competitive UCs, um, they prefer that your child um, choose a major. Is that seeming, is that is that what most of the students are doing going in with an intended major? And if so, should they be focusing on classes towards those majors? Yeah, so I think back in the day, um, there was this sort of idea that, oh, I'm gonna get in through an easier major. Um, and then once I'm there, I'm gonna transfer into engineering or computer science or, um, whatever that really, that major that the student truly wanted. Um, and what colleges and universities time and time again have been saying for several years now at every single counselor conference, conference that we've attended is they really want the students to apply to their intended major. They can have a backup offer, um, a backup major, but really they want to make sure that if the student truly wants engineering, that they apply for engineering. Because once they are there on campus, that does not guarantee that they can then just say, oh, I want to change my major into engineering, right? And so if they've missed those first, um, that first year set of courses that they need for second year, um, they're going to be at a deficit. So it, it's, yes, it is correct. They want students to, um, if they have a major, and if the campus actually requires that the, the students uh, declare a major, that they do the major that they're most interested in, and if they can, um, to select a second backup. And then, yes, you're right, Joanne. They also want to see that the student has taken coursework in high school to solidify um, that, yes, this is truly their interest. So again, high school is really the place that you're supposed to explore to kind of see, uh, what am I interested in? So that when you're applying to college, you really can hone in um, some of the things that you've been involved in or some of your passions that you've experienced in high school. So colleges, our UCs especially, are really looking to see, oh, did they take science majors? Did they take engineering? Were they involved in business, for example? They're applying to business school here. Were they involved in any type of business academy or pathway um, or internship in high school? Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Well, is there any other questions, comments, thoughts? Hey, we just want to say it was a really, really great session. Uh, thanks for all the great information. Uh, we're a lot more informed. This thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please fill out the, the evaluations and the posts and do your homework. Sign yeah. up for CCGI. <laughs> thank you, you everyone. Thank you. We'll thank hang you back. But thank Bye. you.